Cheryl has written a book about kissing. <laughs> Are you going to kiss me? Oh. You're going to give me a kiss. <laughs> Well, I am delighted to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's been a wonderful few days among so many fascinating individuals, and I'm just humbled and honored to share the stage. I want to start by saying I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would be writing an entire book about the science of kissing. By training, I'm a marine scientist. In graduate school, I studied the very charismatic sea cucumber, and <laughs> now I primarily work in energy and environmental policy. But my main goal is to find ways to broaden public understanding of science. And so just over three years ago, I did a short piece on the science of kissing, timed right around Valentine's Day, simply about what happens in our bodies, uh, what, why we might have evolved to be so attracted to another person's lips. And the response was big. But what I didn't anticipate was not just through general members of the public, but Scientists started emailing me and calling me. Anthropologists who were working on related topics wanted to know what maybe I read in endocrinology. Endocrinologists wanted to know if I had seen anything in neuroscience. And it went on and on and on. And I just thought, well, what a wonderful way to put so many different scientific lenses on a single behavior that's near universal and tell a story. And so The Science of Kissing was born as a book. I had a wonderful time writing it. And let's get started. So to begin, I need a volunteer from the audience. <laughs> I'm just kidding, come on. Okay. <laughs> All right, to really get started, I thought uh, briefly we could talk about why do humans kiss? What are some of the evolutionary uh, theories out there? There are a lot of them, especially if you try Googling why we kiss on the internet. But for the purpose of my book, I was only interested in what we might find through the primary literature. And so perhaps the most intriguing to start with is, why are we so attracted to the lips of another person? I spoke to V.S. Ramachandran at UC San Diego about why the color red is so powerful as a signal in our brains. Why are we hardwired to recognize and seek out what this signal means? And he talked a lot about how our ancestors needed to find sustenance uh, when they were foraging for food. And so those that develop the ability to detect the color red first we're more likely to find food, survive, pass on their genes, and over time, perhaps, this red equals reward signal uh, became very important to human beings uh, and our primate ancestors. And as you can see, this is a, a photo of a uh, bonobo bottom in estrus. The same color red over time became emphasized in parts of the female anatomy as a very powerful come-hither kind of signal. Uh, but our human ancestors at some point stood upright, and so the theory goes that our sexual signal shifted as a result. And so we popularly hear about perhaps how the buttocks moved up to the breast and what Desmond Morris calls a genital echo uh, being our lips mimicking uh, female genitalia, he says, in composition, texture, shape, and color. That's one theory. Another theory dates back, uh, well, doesn't really date back very far at all. It deals with our earliest experiences on planet Earth. Babies. Babies' first encounters with love, security, comfort, all of these very, very warm, comfortable emotions are usually associated with lip pressure through nursing. Uh, up until recently, also through pre-mastication, which was the pre-chewing of food for another individual for the purpose of nourishment. Uh, before we had Gerber baby food, pre-mastication was an important way to feed toddlers. And so this theory says that our earliest experiences feeding and feeling these positive associated emotions might lay the foundation in our brains for similar positive associations with lip pressure later in life as adults with romantic partners. But not all kissing is romantic. And so if you just take a look at the third picture, I mean, yes, this is a couple, but you can see when you get that close to another individual, you're not just pressing your lips against theirs, you're engaging all of your senses, you're tasting, you're smelling. It's a, fam it's, it's a way of, of recognition. It's a means of figuring out that someone is part of your family, one of your friends. And all around the world, there have been cultures that have depended on sort of the sniff greeting to recognize members of their clan. We didn't always have light bulbs the way we do today, so relying on our noses was extremely important. 
And so it's possible a lot of anthropologists think that over time, this sniff kiss, this sniff across the face, we have a lot of scent glands around our faces, uh, became associated with a brush of the lips, and so the kiss greeting was born, as we see all over the world today, uh, especially in parts of Europe. But one of the first questions people tended to ask me when I was researching this book, well, do other animals kiss? What do you think? Yes, well, scientists have to be very, very careful when we talk about the emotional lives of other species, because we don't want to say things like love, we don't want to be accused of anthropomorphizing. So instead of saying love, we might say selective proceptivity or mate choice. But when you look around at other species, from moose to birds that preen each other to dogs that will lick pretty much anything that's a noun, person, place or thing, <laughs> it seems like, if we're willing to broaden the definition of kissing to include kissing-like behaviors, that we certainly see many analogs all across the animal kingdom, whether it's as a means of grooming, as a means of uh, social hierarchy, or some kind of affection. What about our own species? Our first literary evidence of kissing dates back 3,500 years to India's Vedic Sanskrit text. There was no word for kiss, but we see things like the young lord licked the slave woman, or a couple sat and drank the moisture of each other's lips. And to me, that sounds an awful lot like two people making out. Um, the kissing kind of pops up and disappears in different parts of the world. It probably arose and disappeared throughout history for so many different reasons. We see a little bit of kissing in Greek culture. Homer actually wrote about kissing, but not romantic kissing. Uh, we have a kiss uh, in supplication when uh, King Priam kisses the man-slaying hands of Achilles to retrieve his son Hector's body. We have kisses as a means of social recognition when Odysseus returns home to Ithaca. But romantic kissing, not as much. Roman culture, on the other hand, had a very, very vibrant, colorful kissing culture. They had many different terms for kissing, and this was something that we see throughout poetry. And it went on and on and on. Um, we have a lot of instances of artworks that depict foot kissing, uh, kissing the feet of popes and kings um, as a reflection of respect. Even Charles Darwin talked about kissing when he traveled around the world. And he postulated that, again, if we're willing to broaden the definition to include kissing-like behaviors of other species, then indeed it is a universal human behavior. Anthropologists estimated in the 1970s over 90 percent of people around the world were kissing, and that was before the rise of the internet, the ease with which we travel, and so I suggest it's even more universal today. The anatomy of the kiss. I'm not sure some of you in the room I know have seen this, because this came up in conversations that I had outside, but this is a statue of what's called the sensory homunculus. It is the brain's eye view of the body in terms of touch. And the first thing you might notice is the lips are enormous, so is the tongue. Our lips are packed with sensitive nerve endings. Even the slightest brush sends a cascade of information to our brains, informing us what to do next. And if you think about it, even though we give so much credit to our eyesight, our mouths are very much part of the important way that we interpret the world. If you look at any infant, they're putting everything into their mouths. It, it tells us about temperature, taste. It tells us a lot about the other person we might be kissing, which I'll talk about in a minute. One of my favorite studies that I came up with, that I came across with, writing this book, dealt with the direction we tilt our heads when going in for a kiss. There's actually a study published in Nature, one of the world's most prominent scientific journals, where a scientist went all around the world to beaches, public parks, and airports, and watched couples make out. Uh, it's published. I think it's a little voyeuristic, but that's just me. Um, but what he found was two-thirds of us seemed to be tilting our heads to the right, notably not correlated with right-handedness. So that's just the beginning, because when we kiss, so much is going on in our bodies. Our pupils can dilate, which is one of the reasons that so many of us close our eyes during a romantic kiss. Our pulse quickens, our breathing can deepen and become irregular. But beyond the physical, a lot's happening in terms of the chemistry in our body. There is an associated rise in dopamine. Dopamine is associated with craving and desire, can't wait to be with someone. There is a rise in serotonin, uh, responsible for obsessive-compulsive thoughts about the other person, also involved in obsessive-compulsive disorder to a larger scale. There's also a rise in what's known as the love hormone, oxytocin, which is responsible for a sense of attachment, that special bond. And what you might notice is the symptoms we associate with falling in love have a chemical basis in our bodies. But I don't think that that takes any of the romance away. And what I meant to mention before, too, is our lips are actually our most exposed erogenous zone. But 
as Moses introduced, one of the things that I thought would be a lot of fun to talk about is the differences between men and women. Or as I titled the chapter, Women Are From Venus, Men Are Easy. Um, <laughs> this is the psychology portion of the book, and uh, it was just, it was absolutely fascinating. There's been a lot of research on this. One particular study that came out of the State University of New York at Albany by Gordon Gallup and his team was interested in the preferences and attitudes of kissing between men and women, surveyed over 1,000 people, and found that women tend to place more emphasis on the act of kissing itself. When asked why they kiss, it's so I can understand how he feels about me, to get a sense of where our relationship is going. Um, they paid attention to breath and teeth, um, hygiene was very important, and basically placed a lot more value on kissing throughout their relationship. OK, so what about the guys? Well, men tended to describe kissing <laughs> as a means to an end. So they would say things like, I'm swapping spit, hoping I might swap some other bodily fluids down the line. You get the idea. Um, they're interested in other things. Uh, they'll cite finding a good kisser as a reason to start a relationship. Um, they'll kiss someone they know only wants to have sex, and on and on and on. I mean, it's a really humorous study, but of course I have to show a graph. This is science, right? Um, differences in willingness to have sex with someone without kissing them. What I love about this, actually repeated it among my friends, you should try the same thing, is men are far more likely to, be, to, to have sex with someone who they aren't kissing, whereas women tend to say, does that subtly imply, imply prostitution? Um, and that's not such a stretch. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But a lot of this has to do with reproductive biology. When I was reading the results, I was getting very frustrated. I don't like gender stereotypes, but I called Gordon Gallup, and we talked a lot about how women have to be a lot more picky about who we choose as a partner. We're fertile for far fewer days of the month, uh, fewer years of our lives, and we have a limited and aging egg supply, whereas men can theoretically impregnate many, many, many women over the course of their lives. So women have developed a keener sense of smell and sense of taste when it comes to using those as tools to evaluate whether they're compatible with someone. How do they do this? OK, you might remember from the film Back to the Future, one of my favorites. I don't know. I assume a lot of people in the room have seen it. But there's this wonderful scene where Marty, who's traveled back 30 years in time, encounters his mother, who accidentally thinks she's falling in love with him. And there's a great scene where she grabs her son for a kiss. And then all of a sudden, she pulls back. She says, I don't know what it is, but something feels wrong. Well, 59% of men, 66% of women say they've ended a budding relationship because of a bad kiss. Women are actually most attracted to the scent of men with a different set of genes that code for a part of the genome called the major histocompatibility complex, the MHC, and codes for immunity. So the advantage of a woman choosing a man with a different MHC would be that down the line, should they reproduce, should they have children, those children would be healthier with more diversity in their immune systems. Um, Notably, the effect is the opposite in women on birth control, which makes you wonder a little bit about why sexual chemistry might change in some couples soon after they get married. I just wanted to mention, too, that in Pretty Woman, Vivian, the uh, prostitute in this story, will not kiss her johns. The screenwriters did their homework throughout history. Prostitutes have not uh, kissed their clients and often reporting that it's too intimate, because I would like to argue that kissing is, in fact, the most intimate behavior that we can engage in, even more so than sex. People tend to describe sex as something that you get lost in. It's more of even a passive thing, where if, as kissing, as I said, you're, all your senses are engaged, and you're using that information to obtain clues about whether you should pursue a deeper connection with this person. I would be remiss if I didn't mention cooties, briefly say. Uh, there are such things as cooties, viruses and bacteria can be transmitted through a kiss, but this is the point in my talk where I do my public service announcement and just say, because of movies like Twilight and True Blood, there's a higher incidence of people biting their partners during sexual activities. Don't bite the ones you love. So at least, <laughs> least uh, it's not a good way to show people that you care. Let's leave it at that. You're injecting gobs of potentially harmful viruses and bacteria into their bloodstream. Stream, never a good idea. And... Ah, the future of kissing, and I do have time to touch on this. OK, so where are we headed? I mean, our species depends on kissing. We love kissing. We spend a lot of time dreaming, writing, thinking about when a kiss will take place and how magical it will be. And it's something that I don't think is going anywhere for a while. But we see on, in movies things like artificial intelligence, um, Austin Powers, for example, these kissing robots. Could that be in our future? Well, it already is in some ways. In Taiwan, these two robots you see to my left, uh, Janet and Tom, uh, are performing robots. They actually go on stage and make out. They don't kiss other people, but they very convincingly kiss each other. 
There is also a video game that's very popular in Japan called Love Plus, where players actually take virtual girlfriends on dates. There's a whole resort where they can go and hang out with their virtual girlfriends. But kissing is an important part of the game. We saw in a talk on the first day, uh, Second Life, and how the avatars in Second Life like to get engaged in certain sexual activities, while kissing is very much a part of that. So as technology changes, I think our desire to connect with other people through this virtual world, through this, this, these computers, uh, is going to be expressed in so many more different ways that we can't even begin to imagine now. Um, more recently in the news, out of Japan, there was this kissing transmission device that was invented. I don't know if anyone caught it, but um, basically you talk to your significant other on the computer, you type, and then you stick this straw-like thing in your mouth, twirl it around, and they can have it in their mouth and feel what you're doing. To me, it seems like it would lack a little bit, possibly pheromones. I talk a lot in the book about pheromones, the possibility of pheromones, what's involved. But, well, the point is that people out there are trying to invent it. And my favorite, or one of my favorite things coming across writing this book is in 2010 at the Adult Film Expo, uh, one of the big ones in, in the States, there was the debut of Roxy, R-O-X-X-X-Y, by True Companion. Roxy is the first fully life-size female adult companion robot that will uh, have a conversation with you, and she'll be your sexual partner. And so I'm reading the website, it sounds very compelling, and I'm thinking, yeah, she can do all this stuff, but can she kiss? And so, you know, I called the engineer, and I think he was a little bit surprised that I was on the other end, you know, not being a client and someone who was just interested in whether his robot could kiss. So I, I said, you know, can Rock, Rock, she can do all these things, can she kiss? And he paused for a bit. He kind of caught his breath and he said, well, her mouth is one of three inputs, but we don't have a kissing function yet. But if people would like it, we'll be willing to build it. <laughs> Roxy is uh, going to have her own companion. They're soon going to be marketing a robot called Rocky for women. And because kissing is so much more of an important part of the sexual experience for women, I'm curious if that might be something that down the line they incorporate into this male robot technology. He said he's very open to comments from clients. Um, not that I expect anyone in the room might be interested, but you can keep that in mind if you are. Um, and with that, I would just like to say thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to Moses for having me. It was just been a treat. That was perfect, Sarah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very this much. Is, this is Stay fun. for the party. Of course. All right, we'll have a good chat. Uh, okay. Picture. Okay. Let's see. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> what a smoothie. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>